Yes, hello everyone. Uh, we have been talking about uh, describing programming languages. First we talked about the levels of the different levels of description. Then we talked about uh, grammar and syntax and now we're going to talk about uh, what are called contextual syntactic uh, constraints. Uh, so we have uh, previously seen that the context-free grammar uh, basically describes which strings in the given language are valid, which strings are syntactically correct. So we can derive all the syntactically con correct strings from our context-free grammar. Uh, However, the context in which these strings appear actually matters. So let's, for example, look at a statement in some programming language that says i is equal to r plus 3. Now, even though this might be a valid string in the language, because we can derive it from, from our grammar, from our context-free grammar, this particular statement might not be valid at the exact uh, location in the program. So why wouldn't it, would it not be valid? Well, one reason could be that the variables i and r might not have been declared. Uh, another possible error is that the type of expression on the right-hand side might not be compatible with the type of the expression on the left-hand side. So, for example, r plus 3 might, the type of that expression might be a, a, an integer, whereas i might be declared as a, uh, as a character. So, uh, this, the particular string here is correct res with respect to the grammar, but it might not be legal in that particular, at that particular location in the program. So we are basically saying that the strings are only legal in a given context. So hence the name contextual syntactic constraints. So there are some syntactic constraints that can apply and those constraints uh, are dependent on the context. So what are the examples of these uh, contextual syntactic constraints? Well, we we mentioned uh, uh, one of them earlier, the, the first one here, and identifier must be declared before uh, use. Another one might, might be the number of actual parameters to a function must be the same as the formal parameters. Well, what are we talking about here? Uh, well, for example, if we define a function in, in Java or C++, same something like this we have a function called f it uh, assumes uh, let's say two parameters the first one is an integer and the second one is a double and then this function performs some calculation and let's say it's actually returns an integer and then later in our or somewhere in our uh, main program we use this function and we have something like uh, k is equal to the result of the function called to f of 4. So what are we doing here? We're, we're using the function f. We are instantiating the function with, uh, or calling the function actually, with uh, only a single parameter. But the uh, signature of the function shows that this particular function expects two parameters, one integer and one double. So even though this uh, statement or this string k is equal to f of 4 is syntactically correct in the sense that it can be derived from the grammar, uh, there are some constraints that make it actually invalid. 
in this case because we are calling a function with too few parameters. Um, the uh, third point here is that in the case of assignment the type of an expression must be compatible with that the, 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 that of the variable to which it is uh, assigned. Well we could actually use exactly this uh, example here. I might have declared uh, k as a double and I'm saying and let's say I'm actually doing this correctly now I'm, I'm calling f with the integer 4 and uh, the double 2 .0. and what I'm getting back is uh, an instance of uh, is, a, is a double number but the function in the function header or in the signature uh, the function is declared such that it returns an integer. So the the type of this right hand side expression is an integer whereas the type of this variable is a double. So we have a type mismatch. So that will be one example and once again this particular string in the language is uh, can be derived from the grammar but there are some constraints that um, uh, that uh, apply here meaning that the type of the expression on the left hand side has to be the type the same as the type of the expression on the right hand side. Uh, what the, not the, the, the example here number four assignments to the control variable of a for loop are not permitted. Um, this is in, in Pascal we probably have something same similar to in uh, in uh, C or C++, one example would be um, if we do something like this here we have a for loop and uh, inside the for loop we perform, perform some statements and then at the very end we do something like this i is equal to i plus 2. Now in Pascal this is not allowed to to change the change explicitly the uh, value of the index variable in the for loop and this is a syntactically correct statement in the sense that it can be derived from the grammar but once again there are some constraints that have been put on it. So it's only valid in a given context that's basically what we are saying. Before using a variable this is the fifth example here before using a variable there must be there must have been an assignment to it. So what are we talking about here? Well in Java where we have uh, uh, declaration well, let's say we have a declaration like int i and then we say um, system out system dot out dot print line i then java the java compiler will complain because i doesn't have any value so this is one 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 more example of a, of a syntactic contextual syntactic constraint Okay, um, so all these examples that we have been talking about here are it's not it's not a possible to describe them using a context-free grammar. So we have been using a context-free grammar to describe the syntax syntax of a language, but these syntactic constraints are, are not possible to describe using a context-free grammar. So if we would like to describe uh, those constraints, we would need a more powerful mechanism. And uh, there is actually a, another type of grammar that is called context sensitive that we could possibly use. Notice the, the, the difference in the terms context free grammar versus context sensitive. So context free means that the uh, uh, strings that can be generated from the grammar are valid uh, 
without consideration to the context. So it's a context-free grammar. Whereas context-sensitive means that the strings that are generated are only valid in a given context. In a given context. So it's sensitive to, to the context. So if we just have a look here. At Wikipedia, here it says a context-sensitive grammar is a formal grammar in which the left-hand side and right-hand sides of any production rules may be surrounded by a context of terminal and non-terminal symbols. So, in the formal definition, it says that a, a, um, a grammar is, is a grammar G that is a four-tuple, which is exactly similar to what we had discussed earlier. A grammar G is a four-tuple. Remember from our discussion a context free grammar is a, is a quadruple or four tuple where we have the non terminals we have the uh, terminal symbols we have the the final state of production so rules and then we have the starting symbol um, which is exactly the same as, as we have here um, but it says that that this particular formal grammar G is context sensitive if all the rules in P these uh, this is the set of rules are of the form are of the following form where we have uh, alpha a beta on the left hand side so a here is one of the non-terminals, but the two surrounding strings, alpha and beta, uh, are strings of non-terminals and terminals. So what this means is that A, the non-terminal, is valid in that given context in, the, in this surrounding, meaning in the context where you have a string of alpha and a string of beta uh, surrounding the non-terminal A. In all the context-free grammars, we only have a single non-terminal symbol on the left-hand side. Notice that all the examples that we have been discussing, we have a single non-terminal on the left-hand side, so without any context, it's context-free. No matter what the context is, we can derive E plus E from that E symbol. We can derive parenthesis left, and, uh, left paren E, right paren from E. There is no context on the left hand side. So this is the difference. An important difference between the context free grammars and context sensitive grammars. Uh, now the question is then, okay, why don't we use context sensitive grammars? If if they can be, uh, if we can express uh, something that is context sensitive by using them. Uh, the problem is that they are very difficult to write. They're difficult to write and they're also difficult to process, meaning that we don't have any automatic techniques for uh, efficient generation of, of compilers or translators from context sensitive grammars. We do, however, have methods of automatic techniques for generating compilers from context free grammars and we will actually see that later. Now, what we have been discussing here are often referred to as semantic constraints as well. So, contextual syntactic constraints are often referred to as semantic constraints. And there are really two types of uh, semantic constraints. Uh, the ones that are called static semantics and the other one called dynamic semantics. And uh, Static semantics basically means that they, they are describable, these constraints are, are describable with variable con context, or, or, or let, me, let me start over. Actually, it's describable with variable contextual constraints on a static basis using the program text. So, this is something 
that can be uh, inferred from the program text itself. So the constraints can be uh, verified by looking at the program text itself. So what will be an example of this? Well, if we go back to the examples earlier, where we, for example, had a, a single parameter to the function f here, this is a constraint that should be verif uh, verifiable by only looking at the program text. I mean, we can see that here we are calling the function with a single parameter, but in the declaration of the function there are two parameters. So if you think of uh, the function, uh, what the compiler would actually do, uh, the compiler could have a semantic component that would check whether the number of parameters in a call to a function um, equals to the number of parameters in the declaration of the function. So this would be an example of a static semantic, describable with a variable contextual constraint by using the program text. Dynamic semantics, however, is something that is uh, uh, that happens during the execution of a program. And one example of that would be, for example, that if uh, whenever a program in a given programming language uh, performs a division by zero, the at runtime that should be acknowledged. So at runtime. Um, the runtime system should be should print out a statement saying uh, a division by zero uh, uh, happened. So that would be something that uh, would be in the category of dynamic semantics because this it is referring to something that happens when uh, the program is executed. <coughs> 